<laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think I'm getting the uh, say, say so to uh, go ahead. Uh, a pleasure to be with you here this morning at COGX. Hope you're having a, a wonderful time. And we have a fantastic panel who are going to be discussing the age of shocks this morning. And I'll introduce them one by one. On my right-hand side, we have uh, Melanie Gerson, who is, or well, has been, amongst other things, head of cyber policy at the Tony Blair Institute, and also currently is based at University College London. On my left-hand side, we have Pippa Margren, uh, who has been the chief econo or the economic advisor to President George W. Bush, and is a tech entrepreneur and best-selling author. And on the left-hand side, just beyond Pippa, from my point of view, we have Gus. Um, Angus Mercer, who is Chief Executive of the Centre for Long-Term Resilience. We're looking forward to a very exciting conversation this morning, and we will touch on a whole variety of the crises that are shaping the world today. But to start us off, I'm going to ask each of our panellists here just to give us a quick insight this morning about whether or not really the age that we're going through, the age of COVID, the age of the Russia-Ukraine war, the age of really huge change in tech, is genuinely something that marks a turning point. And maybe if it is, if there's something that can illustrate that for us today. So, Melly, I'm going to turn to you first to start us <laughs> off. Put me in the hot seat. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here. I, as you list it like that, I think there's no doubt that when we have a confluence of events all happening simultaneously, it's bound to shake up the system as we know it and in the sort of create certainly some sort of systemic shock and sort of a wake-up call for us to it's kind of rethink or hold a mirror to how we're doing what we're doing and are we doing it well and in particular thinking about the different actors from my point of view and the sort of work that I've been looking at the different actors that are sort of coming to the forefront both for good or for bad and how we leverage that but certainly we're seeing systemic change and we're thinking about where tech sits in that of how that interaction happens and who are the key actors or potential important actors that can no longer be left to the sidelines. So if I could just push you perhaps for one example of where you think there's something really transformative, it could be good or bad in the world right now, Melanie, what would be your top choice? I think of what we were talking about earlier, I think it has to be Elon Musk and Starlink and how that's really reshaped if we look at, uh, particularly with the Russia-Ukraine conflict, how intervening there, keeping the internet running and communication running materially affected what was traditional strategic warfare ambition to cut off a communication to then ravage a city and that certain denied and, and not just uh, Starlink but alongside another a number of other tech companies I could talk about later but really materially affected how this war is playing out. Really great specific example to start us off with and, and genuinely transform it I think as you, as you say. Pippa, could we turn to you? Are we at a turning point moment? And if so, could you give us something granular that is turning at this particular point? Yes. So the, th the way to think about it is normally geopolitics plays enormous role in the world economy. We got lucky when the Cold War ended and we got the peace dividend and we didn't have to spend money on nuclear weapons and weapon systems anymore. We were able to devote all that capital and human energy to the economy. Now that's coming unstuck, and we're returning to a more normal situation, which is where geopolitics is a huge driver. Simultaneously with that, there's a very interesting phenomena which Buckminster Fuller, the famous um, architect, geophysicist, uh, described as the knowledge doubling curve, which is at the speed at which information is accumulating and that you need to understand to make a, a decision doubles all the time. So in 1900, it was doubling every century. 1945, it's doubling every 25 years. 1985, it's doubling annually. And IBM is now confirmed by 2020, it doubles every 12 hours. So the speed at which you have to operate is genuinely different from anything we've experienced in history. But the good news is, and the turning points are, that the pace of technological innovation is so extraordinary 
as an example, there's a young kid who just won the, the James Dyson Award. I mean, he's 27. I call him a young kid. But he's 27, and he came, a Philippine national, who came up with the idea that you could take food waste, turn it into solar panels that capture UV light. And it's a revolution in, soul, in, in energy. And similarly, um, we're just seeing the Chinese announced soul, uh, a space-based solar power. These are going to totally diminish our need for hydrocarbons, right? Now, how fast is a different question, but things are moving faster than ever. So I would say this is a return to normal, but it's very different from what we've had for the last 30 years. So there's a massive adjustment going on. Biba, thanks. That's a tremendous amount there to think about, and we're going to pick up some of those themes as we go on through the, uh, through the conversation. But let me turn to you, Gus. Uh, turning point at the moment, and if so, where do you see the most important part of that turn? Thanks, Rana. It's uh, great to be here alongside you all today. I, I think that, yes, there is a, a bit of a turning point here. Um, I'll keep my remarks in the ballpark of extreme risks, which is the, the risks that we trade in every day at CLTR, the, the think tank that I co-founded a few years ago. Um, and by extreme risks, I mean COVID-19 plus in terms of the level of the threat, but, but not just pandemics. Think. For, sim for simple terms, think ABC, AI, biosecurity, climate change, those sorts of big global challenges. Um, and I think we are at a turning point here. Um, and in terms of the specific issues that I worry about, I, I, can, I can talk about them in terms of a couple of statistics. I think it was about a month ago that the World Economic Forum released a poll of risk experts, and it said that nine out of 10 risk experts think that the, the global outlook is becoming more fractured, um, more catastrophic. So we're heading in the wrong direction. And if you look at extreme risks specifically, the uh, Oxford academic Toby Ord wrote a fantastic book called The Precipice, um, ironically about two months before COVID-19 hit, I think it was published. And he crunched the numbers and came up with a, a figure, a, a relatively rough and ready figure, but a pretty startling one, which is there is a one in six chance that we suffer an existential catastrophe over the next 100 years that stems from one of these extreme risks. Now, even if Toby is roughly right in terms of that probability, um, it's clearly an unsustainable level of risk that we're operating at. And given that these risks are sufficiently scary um, to be worried about them, but they're not so likely to happen in any, any given political cycle, it means that we underinvest under and we don't give them the attention that they deserve. Um, and that's the bad news. The good news, I think, uh, to channel Pippa's and Melanie's optimism, I think, <laughs> is that there is a lot that we can do about it. There are concrete, actionable policy interventions that governments can make um, and that we can make globally that can have a real-world impact here. And uh, I can speak to that later. Fantastic. There's a huge amount there to cover, and I'm glad to see that note of optimism coming through. Actually, in some ways, in all three of our speakers' uh, uh, comments, and we'll certainly come back to some of the grounds for that optimism. But I'm afraid I do have to plunge us a little bit into a ride on the back of one of the horses of the apocalypse at the moment, because we are currently going through a variety of global crises. And although tech is very much obviously something on all of our minds, and we're going to be getting to that in just a few minutes. I think we want to focus in first on some of the crises that are reshaping the world, and then think about how tech either might exacerbate or help with those issues. So, Melanie, I know that amongst the many things that you have immense knowledge and talent on is questions of conflict. And right now, we are looking at a world, as of three and a half months ago, in which, for the first time in Europe, at any rate, since 1945, one country has invaded another, broken its territorial boundaries, Russia into uh, Ukraine. There are a variety of consequences that, of course, come from this. But one of the ones I think is concerning an awful lot of us at the moment is the question of energy and whether or not the infinite hunger, or perhaps not infinite, but very kind of extensive hunger for energy that shapes so many of the enterprises that concern us here are going to be fundamentally affected by the global changes over the medium to long term that have come from this particular conflict. What's your thought on that? I mean, it's inevitable. We're already seeing it and feeling it even at the very granular household level that the energy crisis as predicted will be felt. On the other hand, that has caused 
cooperation and relationships to be looked at within the geopolitical sphere to really step back and think about how everyone's been acting independently and to hold a mirror to that and say, you know, it does create a, a breath and a breath to think about where do we want to be going to with energy as a country, as a region and globally. So whilst, and you thought to go back to these kind of breaths, I think, create an in that kind of space to think for the innovators. And the innovators really, like Pippa said, whether you can turn, you know, food waste into a solar panel, is that we have to reduce this reliance and we have to do better. So whilst it will create, it will create short-term harm, that's without, we're going to have short-term hurt across what was we figured this out. The more minds we can get to figuring it out quicker is, you know, is how far we move forward. But it's short-term bad, long-term, I think it will be good. It will then alter, it comes back to this big question, the geopolitical balance and geopolitical system and where cooperation lies within the system. So, Well, could I throw that thought to you, Pippa, in a different sense? Because all that fossil fuel, all that oil, all that gas from Russia is not going nowhere. It's now being funneled much more east than it is west. It's going to China, of course. It's also going to India, which is one of those intriguing states. Again, a state in which the tech world actually has a huge amount of interest now and is providing cheap fuel for a whole variety of enterprises there. Do you see a sort of eastward turn in the Russian energy market having a wider effect on the global economy in the way that Melanie's hinted at? Yes, and we need to think about commodities beyond energy, including wheat and food. And in my personal judgment, Putin absolutely wanted these secondary and tertiary effects of the war in Ukraine to hit the world economy. And that is because, in my view, and I started to write about this in late October last year, and I know what I'm about to say is very shocking, but I argued that we are already in World War III. The good news is that this war is not being conducted on the ground with civilians, except in one location so far. Everywhere else, we're basically at war between the superpowers in space, in cyberspace, on the high seas, particularly submarine warfare, all locations that the public can't see. So I've described it as we're in a hot war in cold places. The Arctic is another place where we're absolutely nose to nose. Um, and Africa as well, which although a hot place, it's a place that the media gives a cold shoulder to, right? So we can call it, we're having a hot war in cold places. And interestingly, we're now having a cold war in hot places, particularly Pacific Islands. And you've seen the Chinese reach out to the Solomon Islands and 10 other islands. And everybody's like, why do they care about islands? It matters if you're in submarine warfare. And so fundamentally, we have to understand we've got to reframe what is the fight. If we keep looking at it as it's only Ukraine, we're going to have a particular understanding of reality. Could, could, but this is global in nature, and it is meant to be by the superpowers. So could I push you on one of the words you use there, Pippa? I think you know people will find that quite alarming in many ways. Sorry. That's probably your intention, no, no, to make sure that <laughs> people are paying attention. You use the word war rather than competition, let's say, which is a term yes. that's heard both in the EU and with the current US administration. In the Arctic, war and or space. Why are you using the word war rather than competition? What's the difference? I'll give you one very specific example. I would say this war officially began January 7th, which was the day the head of the British Defense Forces, Sir Tony Radican, came out and said an event occurred that absolutely should be construed as an act of war. And that was the fastest internet cable in the world is in a tiny little island in Norway called Svalbard. And it's a double cable, very unusual. Why is it there? Because every satellite, pretty much less than 5,000 miles high, connects to Earth at that point, including the International Space Station. And it seems that someone, we won't say who, cut the cable a six and a half kilometer distance apart and took the middle piece away so no one could confuse it with an accident. And what was that about? It's about all your military guidance systems are based on GPS. And frankly, the entire tech community of the world depends on the internet. You cut this, you cut satellites. This is a very profound event. Now that is Arctic, that is space, and that is conflict. That's, and that's war. That's not competition. 
So that's why I say, and th these events, if you look for them, they're there. But because the algorithms are giving you only the news feeds that you've already expressed an interest in, unless you look for it, you won't see it. Pepper, thanks for that. I want to take on that thing again, you very cautiously and tactfully not named a particular bad actor in that in that case, although people may make their own assumptions. But right. with the wider context of Russia-Ukraine here, um, Gus, could I turn to you? Your interests are in long-term resilience. And one of the most immediate and actually short-term issues with a very long-term effect that, again, Melanie's mentioned briefly, is the potentiality for famine. That comes in particular from the fact that cereal crops mm. out of Ukraine and also actually out of parts of Russia are now either under embargo or just impossible to uh, harvest. And of course, the question of what happens for the harvest for 2023 is a question of interest to a huge numbers of countries around the world uh, in the Middle East, in Egypt and elsewhere that have been very dependent on that grain. Mm. What does your training about long term resilience tell you about food supply and the effects of the Russia war on that question? It, it's a really... It's a really interesting question, and I think to, to broaden it out, we can, we can actually look at a range of different extreme risk scenarios playing out at the moment in the world where we're starting to see the very short-run effects of much longer-run challenges. I think if we broaden that out into AI, we're starting to look at the, the very key challenges around algorithmic bias, for example, and that is a very interesting portent into the future challenges that AI will bring on, on biosecurity and pandemic preparedness, where dealing with the firefight of, of COVID-19 on a week-to-week -week and a month-to-month -month basis. And that gives us a portent into what the next pandemic may look like. Um, but in many ways, we could, we could argue that it could be far worse than, than a COVID-19 type event. So from that, from that perspective, we're starting to see the short-term ramifications of these longer-term challenges. And I think that's obviously scary in many, many ways. And, and I think you've, you've given another example um, with respect to food supplies and, and Russia, Ukraine. But there's a really interesting opportunity in all of this. If you look at Ian Bremmer's recent book, The, the Power of Crisis, um, he talks about how we need to leverage these moments that are really big ticket moments in our history, where precisely because the world is so fractured and scary and the risks that we face in many ways are, are, are risks that we've never faced before in human history. Melanie talks about um, or rather Pippa, excuse me, talks about the, 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 the challenges that we're facing around um, Russia, Ukraine, and potentially we're currently at war. Um, I would argue that with respect to extreme risks, AI, biosecurity, climate change, um, in many cases, these risks stem from emerging technologies that haven't been around very long. And because they haven't been around very long, we don't really have a playbook in terms of how to deal with them. Um, but the good news is because yeah. we are in this moment, we have a crisis, there is an opportunity to do something fundamental but about it. Isn't there a problem inherent to what you've, you've, you've just given us um, there, Gus? Because you've given us a really interesting account, and we're going to come back in just two minutes, actually, to some of the implications of that technology. But one of the problems about famine is that, in some sense, it's a very old world problem. It's just something that we haven't actually seen in that form for quite some time. And the question of if you're in a situation where actually there's a war going on right now, which is preventing cereal crops being uh, uh, harvested and actually brought to large parts of the world right now, is it not justified for politicians and people involved with NGOs to say, let's try and find out how to feed people, and then, you know, something like the question of AI biosecurity has to take, if not a back seat, at least a sort of secondary seat, while we deal with the fact that people are starving? Is that a, is that a reasonable division to make? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would in no way argue that we shouldn't be trying to deal with immediate causes and immediate crises, famines, floods, terrorism. For me, this is a yes and question. It's, it's not a case of diverting existing resources away from people who are desperate and need help. I think this is about addressing the root causes of some of these issues. And even if some of the issues, as you say, like, like, like droughts, like famine are age old, their causes aren't and their causes are shifting. And the things that are bringing about, the, the risk factors that are bringing about these issues are in many ways new and, and governments need to start to address them. And, and I'm encouraged by the fact that they are. I think in the UK, we, have, um, we had our first ever AI strategy last year. Um, the new AI defense strategy, I think, is coming out any week now. We are wholesale reviewing our biosecurity approach in the wake of COVID-19. There's a, a national resilience strategy coming down the pipeline. So I think the government gets, and policymakers are starting to get, that we are in this really interesting age of shocks, as we're calling it today. And you can liken it in many ways to what happened after the, the, the Second World War, when we finally got serious about resilience. You know, we, we looked at 
what happened and what did the UK do following that global tragedy? We founded the NHS. We created national insurance. We, we built international institutions um, like the UN, or we helped to build them, um, effectively as a way of saying these risks cannot manifest again in the same way. And I would argue that we are in a similar moment now. We're in a kind of 1945-style moment where mm -hmm. while Russia, Ukraine, while COVID-19 are viscerally alive in the minds of the public, as they should be, we need to leverage that opportunity. And the great news is that there are concrete, actionable things we can do. You know, we can start to think about how to govern AI. Um, so let's, let's, hold, hold that thought for the let's hold that thought for the moment, Gus, because we'll get in just a few minutes to some of the directions we want to travel, I think, in the near future. But let's just talk a little bit, actually, on a theme that comes directly from what you've just said. You mentioned for you know, those of us who were born and brought up in the, in the United Kingdom that 1945 is a moment when actually government takes responsibility for a whole variety of things that hadn't previously been essentially regarded as core government tasks, nationalized healthcare in this country, welfare, pensions, and, and, and so forth. Let's turn the question around, though, in a way which I think a lot of people here at COGX today and the next couple of days will be thinking about, which is governments have power, of course they do, but actually these days, corporates and technology corporates have a level of power and therefore responsibility that simply wasn't the kind of power that even a General Motors or a you know, big traditional corporate would have had back in the 1950s and 1960s. And let's get specific. Mel, if I could turn to you. One of the things that I think is now you know, indisputable in most people's minds is that the public conversation, the public sphere, certainly in most Western countries, has become extremely polarized in many of the traditional you know, great liberal democracies in the United Kingdom, in the United States even more so. What would you say is the level of responsibility that technology companies have for the current state of our public discourse? And is there anything they should be or can be doing about it? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think there's a, we've seen tech companies with incredible power to intentionally or unintentionally do good and that has a sort of a particularly it sort of has side effects they don't always get it right we've seen this in you know in the ukraine conflict in the sense that they've done things that have you know independently stopped cyber attacks that they've been able to support the internet they've continued providing vpns for free so that people can have uh, information even to making sure trying to differentiate between the russian government and russian people and to and at this particular moment in time uh, on the right side of history to in how they're acting. They also get things wrong. And we've seen this with the narratives and the, uh, particularly with on the social media platforms about what type of information is uh, accessible. Does it fuel hatred if we allow Ukraine people to vent their frustration about Russians and to the extent that is that hate speech? So this, it's not... Uh, clear cut. The tension is a natural, you know, you get two conversations. One that says, uh, shall I be quoted by the head of Cato Networks, where there's peace saying, well, forget about Finland, Sweden, Google should be part of NATO, right, on one level. So do we sort of allow that sort of, these have got big tech do you think that's a good things? idea? Should, should, should corporates and big non governmental organizations actually have the kind of uh, capacity to act like states if they have the power and, and capital of a state? I wouldn't go as far as say they should have the power to act like states. I, I believe they should be part of the conversations. I don't think you can have that. But I do believe that it, this is it's very easy to criticize. It's very easy to say, oh my gosh, this is going to bring a new level of doom. Well, I would argue that I think it would be linked to a new level of tech geo responsibility and that they draw geopolitical responsibility and tech companies need to make sure they're set up for it because right now it's a bit ad hoc right now whilst they've intervened in this crisis how are they going to make decisions on the next crisis and are they structurally prepared and whether that means that the large-scale tech companies need to build out a solid transparent foreign policy kind of geopolitical responsibility where they know how the, what their decision making is in any kind of crisis like this. So it's consistent that they've got the right experts in place and it's not ad hoc that they have actions that they then have to rewind or rethink. So that uh, that would be if it, it's a fact, they're there, they have the market capital that outranks many states. Pippa, the conversation that's going on now on social media, which I've said in many aspects has become highly polarized, is clearly very public. But actually, when Melanie was mentioning the word, the idea that we need more experts, people who can actually kind of regulate it, 
Is it genuinely a democratic conversation, or is it just something that happens to be very loud and which is essentially <laughs> being manipulated by people who know what they're doing to people who don't know what's being done to them? Well, that's an assumption. Uh, <laughs> it's a question, not a statement. <laughs> yes, that's an assumption. So we were actually talking about this before it came on. That um, So uh, my father served Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, and Ford. And I grew up in a very bipartisan world. And when I went to the White House uh, as the President's Economic Advisors, I reached out to all the Democrats. And they were like, why are you calling us? I'm like, because when you're going to solve problems, we're going to have to do it together. So let's get each other's phone numbers up front. This just be, it literally makes me a dinosaur. People do not think this way anymore. So why is that? And it's why is it we've reached a point in public dialogue where basically you either agree with me or there are only three options. You're either evil or an idiot or both. But what about the option that I'm wrong? What about the option that I am not right 100% of the time? This option people have totally dismissed. And it's changed the nature of the public dialogue. Now, simultaneously, just to finish, the really great news is that I see a massive decentralization of power. And one side effect of that is the empowerment of the individual, particularly in the tech world, to come up with solutions without needing a big tech corporation behind them, without needing a government behind them. And I see extraordinary innovation in my, from my perch, looking at from a venture capital perspective. Uh, and th that's changing the conversation could, whether governments like it or not. Specific example of that, Pippa. How do you get that kind of grassroots, almost kitchen table style innovation you're discussing? Because most people would assume that to do anything that really makes a difference, you have to have a significant amount of capital oh, and probably corporate backs not. behind you. Okay, Absolutely, so what's, what's your, what's your poster child well, example? Well, I that? can use an example uh, myself, which was um, a, some years ago I co founded a robotics company and we were making industrial drones. Um, and what was so interesting was learning you could create real capability with actually very little capital. And we were going up against, you know, the Chinese, you know, DJI. And we were able to configure something that actually industry said, we need that, we want that. I think this is happening across the board in so many different areas from drug innovation to biotech. Um, I mean, you can buy a genetic sequencing machine for less than $1,000 these days. So this is the key is that, and, and by the way, why are all the major corporates shutting down their um, internal innovation departments? Why bother? Go out and find all the COGX people who are building these cool little companies with very little capital, huge innovation. That's what they're doing because it's smarter. Okay, so Pippa, really interesting practical thought there. Let me throw that to you, Gus, and put a particular framework on it, which is this. Where, and you're probably talking here from a UK perspective, but it could go beyond that. Where does social inclusion come into that? Because while, you know, Pippa is pointing out that there is the possibility to kind of start from the grassroots, you have to have the knowledge base. You have to have some sort of technical training. We all know that we have networks of privilege that maybe have some level of permeability in them, but not everyone starts from the same starting point. So how do we increase the capacity of society to enable those kind of stories that Pippa's telling us to happen much more broadly than they happen now? It's, it's a great question, Ron. I, my, my sense of this is that there, there's clearly a need uh, for governments to play a role in setting a framework to ensure that the technologies that we are developing are being used for good, that they're not being used irresponsibly, um, that mistakes can't happen, that are high consequence. Um, and I think one of the ways that you do that is you go out there and ask questions. Uh, my, my former role in government was, was uh, an external affairs role uh, at the Department for International Development. And, uh, and our job, and the, 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 the job of external affairs departments across government is to go out there and to talk to people, uh, individuals, academics, civil society, uh, non-profits, charities, um, precisely to filter that information through. And I think corporates have a very similar mechanism. Um, for me, this challenge plays out day to day in terms of how do we get the best ideas, the most innovative ideas to policymakers? Um, because they're at a bit of a disadvantage here. They're up against organizations, private sector organizations who can pay top dollar for the very best technical talent. Um, how do you equip a government with the technical understanding of the issues that it's supposed to be regulating or thinking about? It's very, very difficult. Um, so 
that's really the origin of our think tank is to try and play that bridging connection between folks who have ideas for what did the, the, the cogex exam question of how do we make the next 10 years go well it's individuals who know the answer to that it's it's academics sitting in um in their departments it's young technologists um it's people who are who have experienced the downsides of issues like algorithmic bias um it's making sure that there is an open and transparent conversation, but then critically making it action-oriented. I think what, what we try to do is to take that experience, take that academic knowledge, take the 35-page the, the, the journal, but crystallize it into something that is concrete and actionable that a government can look at and say, yes, this is what our future AI policy is going to look like. This is what future of pandemic preparedness is going to look like. And you know, bring it down to that quite technocratic bullets on one A4 side of paper that a, a, an advisor might actually read. <laughs> that's, that's what we need to get to. And, and I think that I'm, I'm less close to the corporate world, but my sense is that uh, listening and distilling information into practical, action-oriented um, ways forward is, 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 is what we need to be doing. Pippi, you want to come back in? I do. So I'm on the board of something called the Green Oscars, where we give prizes to the best clean tech startups um, particularly out of the Spanish-speaking world. But what I see in that is that all of these tiny little groups of people who haven't been to Stanford, who don't come from the, quote, right networks, none of them are going to get any money from the VC world. And who does the VC world give the money to? Half of it goes to people who graduated from five universities. I mean, really. And percentage-wise, it's like, what, 3% goes to women and almost nothing goes to anyone of color. It's absurd. It's broken. It's just, it's not useful. Um, and by the way, the whole philosophy is we can blow 90% of the money on 90% of the investments. Actually, you know, we're only looking for unicorns. So anything less than a unicorn is a waste of time. And you're like, really, if you create half a billion dollars worth of real value, that's a waste of time? Like, our whole philosophy and attitude towards the startup community is so wrong. Um, and so what I see is a world where people of color, women, people with brilliant ideas but didn't go to Stanford, they are basically finding their own way forward. And yes, it will take them longer because they don't have the benefit of all the cash and all the PR that comes from having a Silicon Valley backer. But they are not stopping. And, and this geopolitical turmoil in the world where they begin to realize the, the government's not going to look after me. I'm going to have to look after myself. So they're actually running faster than ever before. And I think we're going to find that 10 years from now, so many success stories, and we'll acknowledge it then. But it would be better if we got in front of it now. Great. Well, Melanie, a quick thought of that. Can we overcome the age of shocks that we're living through now by looking to include more people, more thinkers, a different way of doing things, more grassroots? Um, I mean, I've, we were talking about this uh, before, I mean, the need for diverse voices at the table. I think what we need to still step back and remember that there's still 4.1 billion people to get onto the internet. That, and the very internet that's required to do this is at, under threat from geopolitics and being under threat of being ripped apart. So we need to sort of sometimes, you know, it's very easy to get full throttle into like the fast innovation ecosystem and there is so much possibility there, but that diversity of voices making sure that that includes lower and middle income countries, that includes the different perspectives, that AI ethics is being framed from not just from white, you know, white Western liberal order, but we're including a diverse range of voices into that. On, on, on that, Melanie, I mean, we are, you know, in general, the conversations for very understandable reasons in the West, very wary about China. But if you had to mention a middle income country on average that has actually internet enabled huge numbers of its population, China would be the poster child, wouldn't it? Uh, it would be, and also the way they're rolling it out across Africa, across Pacific, across, I was uh, not long ago uh, in the Caribbean, if you opened the Lucky newspaper, <laughs> <laughs> it was for work. <laughs> but oh, it was a good place to have to go for work, yes. but, uh, but you open the newspaper and it's like a China fan club newspaper in the middle of an island in the Caribbean because they're providing the infrastructure and with that, the potential for philosophy and they're being the agents of growth. 
but that we also have to work with that and not against it in enabling voices from low and middle income countries to work with the structure they've been given safely to still be part of the innovation economy that we also envisage. I'm conscious of the need to, to include voices, if we say, <laughs> including voices from our audience here at COGX today. And we've got just under 10 minutes in which we can take some questions and thoughts and then bring them back to our fantastic panel. So could I see any hands going up, please? And we'll try and call a couple of people. Uh, yep, I think there's a, um, a, a woman in the middle there. Yes, yep, waving hand, please. Thank you so much. I'm Yolanda Lanquist from the Future Society, which is a nonprofit in the US. And we're supporting three governments in Africa right now with their national AI strategies, also with GIZ and Smart Africa. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how, besides China, we can participate, uh, European countries, European governments, European companies especially, in supporting digital infrastructure rollout and inclusion digital skills development, capacity building, um, exchanges of lecturers in AI. These are the things that are really needed to overcome the challenges in talent, in digital infrastructure and inclusion. Access to computing powder, power, which is too expensive for startups in Africa. Thanks. Because there are, and we see, so many really fascinating entrepreneurs and startups doing really exciting things oh. and sustainable development goals across the continent. Yolanda, thanks. Great question. What we're going to do is take a couple more voices and then we can bring them back just to make sure we get as many people in as, uh, as possible in limited time. So, could I see hands again? Uh, yeah, okay. Gentleman with a beard here. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Um, Emilio Salmonyatis, child psychiatrist and digital innovation yeah. and ethics lead. Um, two points. Just to follow on from that great question, I thought Angus missed a trick by not mentioning low code, no code, and, and that being a, a, a huge democratizer. So it would have been good to hear a little bit about your thoughts about that. Um, but also, Pippa, uh, your, your point about this kind of silent war that's going on. Um, and just what I'd like to know is why is it silent? Why are they keeping it underground? And what impact does that then have for the future and some of the stuff that Melanie was talking about? Thank you. Thanks very much. That's great. Let's take one more and then come back to our panel. Um, yeah, I think we've got a hand right there at the back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Ben Morris from the BBC. Uh, have lessons been learned from the COVID-19 pandemic about how we could mitigate a future more serious uh, epidemic? Great question. Thanks very much, Ben. What I'm going to do is, if I may be somewhat doctrinaire and top down, because we've got limited time, is to sort of distribute questions directed at each of you. And if I'd ask you each to give fairly concise answers that we stick with in time, but I think some are clearly oriented towards, towards, um, uh, to, towards particular people. Um, could I start with Yolanda's question about um, Sub-Saharan Africa? Well, it could be um, Saharan Africa as well, of course, in fact, and the rollout and so forth. And I'm going to start with you on that, Pippa, if I may. Absolutely. I would say look at uh, a company called Africa's Talking. It's basically more than 100,000 African coders. And every tech company depends on code. Frankly, everything these days depends on code. And if I had to pick the one part of the world where I want to work with those coders, the most capable, least expensive coders on the planet now are all in Africa. And this is not the mentality. People think they're going to go to Silicon Valley for coders, but I think it's totally reversed. So that's number one. Um, and number two, we've got to understand GPT-3, which is this new low code, no code. Basically, we're going to be able to code in plain English or plain Swahili or plain whatever your native tongue is without needing to be a coding expert. That's a revolution. It's a total revolution. Thanks very much, Pippa. Let me throw that to you as well, Molly. Yeah, um, and thank you for your question. And as you will probably know, that in your own work, there's such a state, different stages of development. So whilst we're thinking at one level, and a lot of these countries want to leapfrog into an AI strategy, there's still fundamental questions of digitalization, understanding basic data strategies, sort of understanding data governance and data sharing, that is really critical conversations, as well as getting people online at the same time. So there's, it's a little bit of rolling back and stepping forward and from a cyber security perspective as well making sure that security is not forgotten in that because there's a huge gap between the amount of drive towards innovation and lack of investment in security that's also creating massive exposure with Africa being one of the hardest hit places for like low level cyber attacks at the moment that are really interfering. So it's had to be 
a individualized but um, really holistic picture of how to do this. Melanie, thanks for, uh, for that. Gus, could we get two concise thoughts from you on those two questions, both of which I think had your name on them. One is low code, no code as well. And the other one is Ben Morris's question at the end about the COVID lessons. Absolutely. Um, low code, no code, absolutely. I think one of, the, one of the real challenges that government face at the moment, and I've talked about this a little bit, is, is upskilling and ensuring that it can match corporates and match fantastic individuals uh, from all over the world who have ideas and thoughts about how to ensure that we are building an inclusive AI economy and that we are making sure that we are resilient to the risks as well as, well as alive to the opportunities that the AI will bring. So I think it's just a, 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 a real endorsement of that. I, fr from, from the perspective of COVID-19, um, I think clearly there are lessons to learn across the world in terms of how, the, uh, how we responded to COVID-19 and how prepared we were for it. Um, in the UK, I think it's, it's instructive to look at our national risk register. Um, pandemics were on there, but we were out by an order of magnitude in terms of the, the predicted number of fatalities that a non-flu pandemic like COVID-19 could cause. So, so clearly there's, there's low-lying fruit there in terms of improvements. Um, but what's really crucial when it comes to COVID-19 and learning the appropriate lessons is that we can't just fight the last war. We can't just prepare a better COVID-19 plan. We need to think about the full range of biological threats that keep biosecurity experts up at night. And, and make no mistake, COVID-19, as, as tragic as it was, could have been a lot worse. And we need to think about how it could have been worse. We need to think about not just naturally occurring pandemics. We need to think about the full range of threats. We need to think about uh, lab security and biosafety and, and how to make sure that we are regulating our labs in the same way that we regulate our airlines, for example. Um, and when it comes to biological security more broadly than that, we need to look at um, biological weapons and how easy, uh, and Pippa has alluded to this already, how easy it is to, uh, to synthesize pathogens and the access that many people will have, many smart people will have, to be able to do immense harm. So. We need to just not just fight the last war, but look at the full range of threats that we face. And I'm encouraged, I have to say, by how well we're doing on that front in the UK. There is a wholesale review of the UK's approach to biosecurity underway at the moment. Um, lots of, lots of organisations, I think, are feeding into that. There's obviously the COVID-19 inquiry that will, that will listen, importantly, to, to victims and their families, as well as technologists and, academ and academia. So I think we're moving in the right direction and we're starting to realize that we are in this, Gus, this that, important moment. That, that, that's great to, to have. What I'm going to do with the very limited time is to give each of our other two speakers perhaps 30 seconds each just to add uh, a cap on, on that thought. Pippa. Uh, well, actually, do you mind if I go back to this yes, question on the silent the war silent that war, was yes, directed do, to yeah, me? Of course. So um, I lecture at Sandhurst and I uh, occasionally brief the NATO generals. So and I spend a lot of time in the strategic security world and I would say the fundamental driver is a kind of arrogance that comes from the fact that the conflict is happening in locations no one in the general public can see. Because we have uh, events happening with satellites being blown up in space, there's no one there to witness it. So, and I would say second of all, um, when I talk to journalists, I say, why are you not covering the story of the Svalbard cable cut? Why are you not covering the story of satellites being blown up and creating debris fields? And, and the answer is, um, one of the editors said to me, if it bleeds, it leads. That's the rule. In other words, if there's no human who has died, there's no story. Now, I have fear that this means we're going to get more dead humans because we won't report what's happening that could lead to that. An important warning. Thank you, Pippa. And a brief thought from Melanie. Yeah, just to build on that, that if the one thing we learn from an age of shocks and things not being reported is to take that breath, to look at sort of some honest self-criticism at what we're missing and to rededicate ourselves to doing it right because that's how we're going to have to move forward. Wise words for a very important era, the age of shocks, but I think we've been reassured there are voices and thoughts and ideas, I hope, that are going to help us get through it in the next 5, 10 or 50 years, however long it might be. We've had a wonderful event for our panel. I wish we could have more, but enjoy the rest of COGX, and thank you very much to Gus Mercer, to Pippa Malgren, and to Melanie Garson. Thank you. <laughs>